So if you're not familiar with machine learning, uh, this talk should provide a good uh, entryway into it. If you are familiar with machine learning, hopefully it'll give you a somewhat different perspective on it. So I've somewhat fancifully called it the five tribes of machine learning and, and, what, you can, um, and what you can take from each. Let me start with a very simple question. Where does knowledge come from? In the past, it came from three places. Evolution, right? That's the knowledge that's encoded in your DNA. Experience, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your synapses. And culture, the knowledge that you acquire by talking with people, by reading books, and so on. And each of these was a major development, you know, in, in the story of life on Earth. I mean, the first one was the emergence of life itself. Uh, you know, the second one is, is what really distinguishes, you know, mammals from, you know, cockroaches. And the third one is what makes us, you know, uh, human so successful as a species. Okay. Now, the amazing thing that has happened in just the last couple of decades is that there is now a new source of knowledge. And it's, it's a hidden source of knowledge. <laughs> it's hiding in there somewhere. Oh, there we go. Computers. A lot of knowledge is now discovered by computers. And, you know, machine learning is the field that studies that. Okay? And this change is as momentous as the previous three. And it's only just beginning, right? We already see machine learning all over the place, but things are only beginning. Notice how each of these forms of, of knowledge uh, uh, discovery is a, a lot faster than the previous one, right? So, you know, experience learns orders of magnitude faster than, than evolution and so forth, and learns orders of magnitude more knowledge, okay? And knowledge is what makes us, you know, what we are is, to, you know, everything that we do and have depends on our knowledge, right? That's what distinguishes us from, you know, from, from animals in the jungle. And now computers are going to discover knowledge orders of magnitude faster and in orders of magnitude larger quantities than we already do. So this is indeed a, a, a momentous change. In fact, uh, if you listen to Yann Lecun, which who was just in the previous video, right? Yann Lecun, right, he's, he's one of the creators of VACPROP, but he's also these days, uh, you know, uh, Facebook's director of AI research. And he says that most of the knowledge in the world in the future is going to be extracted by machines and will reside in machines. So this is something that if you want to, you know, live a good life and a successful life in the 21st century, you, you, you probably want to, you know, uh, understand and, and, and master. So, how do computers discover new knowledge? Well, uh, what I'm going to try to do in, you know, in 45 minutes here is just give you, you know, an overview of, of how this all happens, which I think is not only useful but also uh, quite fascinating. There are, of course, you know, bazillions of machine learning algorithms, but I think there are five key ideas on which most of machine learning is based. The first idea is that you discover new knowledge largely in the same way that a scientist discovers new knowledge, by, you know, observing things, by formulating hypotheses, testing them, refining them, and so forth. So this is one way. Another way is to say, well, the best learning machine out there is your brain. So let's reverse engineer it. Let us emulate the brain on the computer and learn that way. The third one is to say, well, there's something even better than that. It's evolution, right? Because evolution not only made the brain, it made the rest of you and the rest of, you know, everybody and everything else. So that must be a pretty good learning algorithm. So let's see if we can emulate that on the computer. The fourth one is to say, well, all knowledge that comes from data is necessarily going to be uncertain, right? You're never going to be sure. So let us start with, you know, you know, a distribution, a probability distribution of our hypothesis, and then gradually try to reduce that uncertainty, one step at a time, okay? Until hopefully we will have a lot of good knowledge that we're fairly certain of. And the final one, in some ways the simplest one, is something that we do every day without even noticing it, which is to reason by analogy, which is when you have a new problem, try to find similar problems in your experience, right? And then the way you solve the previous one or the answer that you had for the previous one, hopefully you can also apply to this one, perhaps with some modification. Okay? So these are the five main ideas, and associated with them, there are five major schools of thought in machine learning. 
Right? There are whole research areas and thousands of people working in each one of these paradigms. The first one is the symbolists. In some ways, the oldest one. It has its roots in logic, philosophy, uh, mathematics, and so on. Each of, it, each of these tribes has its own master algorithm, which is a general purpose learner that can, in principle, be used to learn anything from data. Okay? And largely what I'm going to do here is, is, is give the main idea in each one of these uh, you know, master algorithms and then make the point that each of these master algorithms is only solving one problem. And to really do you know, general purpose learning, we need to solve all of those problems at the same time. So the research question that I and others have been working on is, how can we combine them into one algorithm that re really is the master algorithm that really can learn uh, you know, any knowledge from data? Okay? So the second tribe uh, is the connectionists, you know, known these days as deep learning. Right? And Yan LeCan, who you just saw, is, is one of their you know, uh, best known members. Connectionists, you know, since their idea is to reverse engineer the brain, their origins are, are of course, in, in, uh, in, in neuroscience. And their master algorithm is backpropagation, which, you know, the, the video that you just saw actually started to explain. Then there's the evolutionaries who uh, have their roots in evolutionary biology. And their master algorithm is genetic programming. We'll also see what, what the basic idea there is. The Bayesians are the people who are really focused on the problem of uncertainty. They have their origins in statistics, and their master algorithm is probabilistic inference. Okay? And finally, the analogizers, they actually have roots in a lot of fields, but perhaps the most important one is psychology, because there's a lot of you know, experimental psychology showing that we humans do a lot of analogical reasoning. And they have several you know, algorithms, but perhaps the most widely used one, or certainly the most successful one, is kernel machines, okay? also known as support vector machines. So we're going to see the main ideas in, 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 in each one of these and, and, and what is the problem that it's, that it's solving. So let's start with the symbolists. You know, here are some of the most famous symbolists in the world. There's Tom Mitchell at CMU, Steve Muggleton in, in, in the UK, you know, Ross Quinlan in Australia. It's a, it's a very international school. And the basic idea of the symbolist is actually, a, it's a brilliant idea. It's very simple. It was actually first proposed in the 19th century, but it only became you know, a real algorithm you know, in, in, the, in the 1980s. Steve Muggleton and others developed that. And this is the idea that we, you know, learning, right? Learning is the problem of induction. It's the problem of going from specific facts to general rules, right? And the induction is the opposite of deduction, right? Deduction is when you go from general knowledge to specific facts, to specific inferences. And the idea here is to do induction, i.e. to do machine learning, by viewing it as the inverse operation of deduction. In the same way that subtraction is the inverse operation of addition, or you know, uh, taking roots is the inverse operation of, 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 of taking powers, or you know, integration is the inverse of differentiation, and so forth. So for example, addition right, gives us the answer to the problem, if I add 2 and 2 is the result, but then the inverse operation, subtraction, is the answer to the question, what do I need to add to 2 to get 4? And the answer is, of course, 2. Okay, now, in, in exact parallel with that, deduction right, allows it to go from Socrates is human and humans are mortal to the consequence of these two, which is, of course, that Socrates is mortal. But induction is the inverse of this. It's asking the question, what do, if I know that Socrates is human, what else do I need to know in order to be able to infer that Socrates is mortal? Okay? And well, of course, if you know that humans are mortal, then you can combine those two and get this. So the answer or an answer is humans are mortal. And we've just discovered the new general rule. And now we, keep, you know, we can keep on doing this in a virtuous circle and induce a lot of rules that we can then combine in arbitrary ways. So it's very powerful. Okay? As an illustration of the power of this, Let me try to do it this way, perhaps. Here's an illustration of the power of inverse deduction. There's a molecular biologist in this picture, but it's not who you think. It's not this guy here. This guy is Ross King. He's a computer scientist. And the other guy, I believe, is also a computer scientist, but I'm not sure. The biologist in here 
is this machine. This machine is a robot that's a complete scientist in a box. It knows molecular biology, it knows about genes and proteins and, 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 and how they work, and it formulates hypotheses about the metabolism of particular cells, and then it actually physically carries out the experiments on its own, looks at the observations, applies inverse deduction, refines or formulates, formulates new hypotheses, and keeps going like this. Right now, there are only two of these robots in the world. One of them is called Adam, and the other one is called Eve. And Eve just discovered the new malaria drug, which is now being tested. And now, the, the amazing thing about this is that, well, once you know how to make one of these, you can make a million. And now you have a million scientists. And they can work day and night. They don't get tired. They, you know, they, they don't get depressed because of bad results, and so on and so forth. Okay. <laughs> So this, I think, is a good illustration of the power, you know, not only of inverse deduction, but, but of machine learning in general, and of the way, you know, things are going. In the future, we're going to see more and more scientists like this. And, of course, there are similar things also in, in, in other domains, but I think this is an interesting one. Okay, second one, connectionism, also known as neural networks and these days deep learning. Okay? So the most prominent connectionist is Jeff Hinton. He actually started out as a, um, as a psychologist, but these days he's more of a computer scientist. His goal was and still is to figure out how the brain works. In fact, he says that one day, you know, he came home from work saying, yay, I figured it out. I, 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 I figured out how the brain works. And, and his daughter said, oh, dad, not again. <laughs> so, you know, so he's persistent and, you know, and he's, he's had definitely some successes. And two other, you know, prominent ones are, are Yen LeCun and, uh, and, and Joshua Benjia. So the idea in connectionism, as I already mentioned, is to reverse engineer the brain. Okay? So how do we reverse engineer the brain? Well, the, the brain is made of neurons, right? What is a neuron? A neuron is a cell that's very different from the other cells in your body. It looks a little bit like a tree. The roots are, you know, this is the cell body, and here are the roots. These are called dendrites. And on the dendrites, you know, it receives electrical impulses from other neurons. And if the sum of those electrical impulses, weighted by how, how you know, strong the dendrites are, exceeds a certain threshold, then it fires what is called an action potential, which is literally an electric discharge. And then that goes to, you know, on the axon is the trunk, and then that discharge goes down to the, to the branches, and then those branches connect with the dendrites of other neurons at things called synapses. Okay? And all you're learning, everything that you know, is in the strengths of those synapses. When synapses get used repeatedly, they get stronger, and so it becomes easier to fire the downstream neuron. And this, in a, in a nutshell, is how your brain learns. So what we're going to do is to, first of all, implement this on a computer right, by creating the simplest model we can of a neuron that will still have the key properties. And the simplest model just goes like this. Uh, you you know, here are my inputs. I, I do a weighted combination of them, so I multiply each one by a weight, and, and I take the sum. And then, it, and then I pass that sum through a, thresh, through a threshold function. It could also be a soft threshold, but either way, it has to be a nonlinearity. Okay? So this is my model of a neuron. Okay? Now, the, the whole question is, like, how do I learn using a model like this? Right? Well, I'm going to connect these neurons, of course, in large networks, hopefully with many layers. That's where the name deep learning comes from is that it's deep networks with many layers. And now I have this big, you know, spaghetti, and now how do I learn? Okay. Well, the, 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 the idea of how we learn, you know, the, the video, you know, uh, started to explain that, you know, he, let, let me sort of like me go the rest of the way and, and, and give it in a somewhat more abstract form, right? The, the way we learn, and again, there's a lot of evidence this is also how humans learn, is error driven. Is if the network isn't making a mistake, then nothing needs to happen. It's when it makes an error that a change needs to happen. So for example, suppose that I want to build a neural network to recognize cats, right? I show it images of cats, and it should, and it should have the value 1 when it's a cat. I show it images of other things like dogs and chairs and, and tables, and the output should be 0, okay? So the way I train this is like this. I put my image of the cat here, and then I compute, you know, the, the, the values of these neurons, the way, I, you know, the way we just described. And then we see what the output is. Now, if the output is one and it was a cat, then great, you know, don't, don't go fixing what ain't broke. Nothing needs to happen. 
On the other hand, if this was supposed to be a cat, but the output isn't one, it's zero or 0.5 or 0.3 or something like that, then the output needs to go up, okay? Another whole question is like, how do we make the output go up? And the basic, basic idea is the following is, well, here at the output, we can see, you know, what is the difference between what we wanted to produce and what we actually have, right? And now what we do is, we push that through the neuron going backwards. That's why this is called back propagation because we're propagating the errors backward through the network, you know, through these weights to the next neurons. And we say, well, you're making a mistake. You have a large weight, so you need to change a lot, right? Maybe this guy, you know, is positive, so it needs to go up to make it go up, to make the output go up. Maybe this guy was, was negative, in which case, you know, it needs to go down, right? This weight needs to go down so that the output gets to be higher. And then from these guys, I do the exact same thing going to the previous layer until I'm at the input, okay? And I basically keep on doing this until I've converged to hopefully a global optimum, but more often a, 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 a local optimum, okay? And this, in a nutshell, is, is how backprop works. And these days, you know, backprop is very successful indeed, right? It's how YouTube, you know, finds videos for you. It's how a lot of image recognition happens. It's how Skype does, you know, trans, you know live real-time translation from one language to another, right? You know, deep learning is, is, is all over the place. One famous example, you know, it was, you know, on the first page of the New York Times is, is, the, is the Google Cat Network, right? The Google Cat Network was at the time the, the largest network ever trained. It has billions of parameters. And what it did was watch a lot of YouTube videos and learn to recognize the things uh, in them, including in particular cats, right? Because you, you, I don't know if you know that, but you know people really, really like to post videos of their cats. So that's so. So you, we have an easier time learning about cats than we say, you know, learning about lizards because there are fewer, you know, videos of, of lizards on the web. Now the evolutionaries say, no, 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 no. The greatest learning algorithm on Earth is not the brain; it's evolution, because evolution not only did it make the brain, it made everything else as well. Evolution, you know, evolutionary learning was, was uh, largely the brainchild of John Holland, right? He was the real pioneer, you know, going all the way back to the 50s. And actually, he just recently uh, uh, passed away. Another very famous one, the creator of, John, uh, of um, genetic programming was John Koza. And more recently, you know, Hod Lipson has done a bunch of, of interesting, you know, things that, that we will look at. So the basic idea in, in, uh, in, the, you know, in the evolutionary paradigm is to say, well, we, we have a rough understanding of how evolution works. So let's implement that on the computer and let the computer evolve things, okay? So how does evolution work? Well, um, we have a population at any given point, right? And we know that in our case, you know, what we have, you know, our chromosomes are strings of DNA, but this is a, gonna be a computer, so let's just make them strings of zeros and ones, okay? And then, you know, the, the, the creature is going to their environment, right? And they have, and they score a fitness value. If they do very well, they have high fitness. If they mess up, they have low fitness and so forth. And then the organisms corresponding to the genomes with the highest fitness get to pass, you know, themselves, their genes onto the next generation. You know, they get randomly mutated. You know, they get to cross over, meaning you combine, you know, genes from one parent with genes from the other and, and, and so forth. Okay. And then this repeats. Then the new population is going to be tested on the task again and the ones that show the highest fitness will get to reproduce. And we keep on doing this until we're satisfied, okay? So this is the basic idea behind what are called genetic algorithms. You know, this was John Holland's term. John Coase's idea was to say, well, actually, you know, why should my organisms be bit strings? That's a very low level representation, okay? And it's easy to mock up a good program by cutting it in a random place when you do crossover. Why don't we have, why don't we let our individuals actually be program trees, right? We want to induce programs, and if you think about it, the program is really, you know, a tree of operations, of subroutine calls, you know, all the way to individual additions or ands and ors and, and what have you, okay? So what we have, you know, in the population is, is, you know, for example, two trees like this, right? And then we pick a crossover point in each tree. Let's say this is the cr crossover point that we pick, and then we switch the subtrees, okay? So from these two parents, one of, from, 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 <laughs> this is all happening in the cloud. From these two parents, uh, we will get one, one child that is all the white nodes and, and one child that is all the black nodes, okay? 
So this is a faster and more powerful way to learn things. And, you know, Koza is very confident that this is, you know, the master algorithm in the sense that it can learn anything and it can beat humans at their own game. And indeed, it has done, you know, some amazing things like, you know, discovering new electronic circuits that have been patented and so forth. Okay. Perhaps the most interesting application to date of, uh, um, of evolutionary learning, and, and, and one that's very hot right now, is this idea of evolutionary robotics. And the idea in evolutionary robotics is that we're not actually just going to simulate evolution on the computer anymore. We're going to simulate it like live in the real world. We're going to have a 3D printer, and we have a population of robots, and this is a natural real robot from, from Hod Lipson's lab. You know, those robots will perform their tasks, they will get a fitness score, and the ones that get the highest fitness score get to program the 3D printer to produce the next generation of robots. I don't know if this is exciting or scary or both, but you know, if, if you see a spider running around, you know, it, it, it might be one of these, one of these days, okay? And hopefully, you know, the robots won't get out of, the, out, of, out of control and take over and so on. I don't think they will, but, but hey, it's, it's something that comes to mind when you see this. Okay, now the Bayesians. The Bayesians come from a very different origin, right? So this is one of the things that makes machine learning fun is that, you know, the algorithms all come from different disciplines, right? You already saw logic and philosophy and neuroscience and evolutionary biology, and now Bayesianism is something that comes from statistics, okay? And, you know, the, the most famous Bayesian, at least within computer science, is probably Huda Pearl. Uh, he invented Bayesian networks, and, uh, and he won the Turing Award a few years ago for that. The Turing Award is the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. You know, David Heckerman and Mike Jordan are two other, you know, very famous Bayesians. And the Bayesians of all the machine learning tribes are probably the most fanatical. Bayesians have a real religious devotion to their paradigm. The reason that's the case is that, for, you know, Bayesians, you know, it comes from statistics. And in statistics, you know, ever since the discipline, you know, exists, essentially, in particular in the 20th century, was dominated by what's called frequentism. And Bayesians were an oppressed minority. Right? The mainstream of statistics thought they were crazy, and they really had to hold on to their faith, and it's a good thing they did, because a lot of good things have, have come out of it. In fact, Bayesians love base, so um, Bayesianism, as you probably have heard, is based on Bayes' theorem, right? That's where the name comes from, right? Bayes' theorem is how we do this thing of, you know, updating our confidence in different hypotheses until we're fairly sure what the answer is, okay? And we're going to see how that works in, in, in just a second, you know. Bayesians love, love Bayes' theorem so much that, you know, a Bayesian machine learning startup actually had a, a Bayes' theorem made, you know, in neon and put it, you know, outside their office, right? This is actually, this is, this is, this is an actual real, you know, neon sign of, of Bayes' theorem, okay? So, so what, what is Bayes' theorem all about, right? Bayes' theorem is actually an incredibly simple idea. It's almost, you know, barely worth being called a theorem, except, except that it's, you know, so powerful. Bayes' theorem is powerful because it let, it, what, it, what it allows us to do is to update our beliefs in a consistent way as we see evidence. So the idea in Bayesian learning is that you have a set of hypotheses, right, the hypothesis that you might use to explain the world, and you start out with a prior degree of belief in, in, your, in each hypothesis. This is called the prior. So P of H is how much you believe each hypothesis. And the hypothesis could be a neural network. It could be a decision tree. It could be, an, it could be a vision network. It could be lots of things. But you have a space of hypotheses, and a priori, that's how much you believe in each one of them. That's your prior probability P of H. And then what you do is you compute the probability of the hypothesis after seeing evidence. Every time that you see a new piece of evidence, you multiply your probability by the, by the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis which is called the likelihood, and then this gives you the posterior probability of the hypothesis, which is how likely it is after you've seen the evidence, okay? And, you know, to make this all add up to one, you also have to divide by, by what's called the marginal probability of the evidence, which is the probability of seeing that evidence irrespective of which hypothesis is true, okay? Now, this is very simple. Where things get very complicated is when you have a large space of hypotheses like vision networks, and now actually computing these probabilities can become intractable. But then the Bayesians have lots of very clever ways to do the inference, like, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo and belief propagation and, and variational inference and so on. Okay. So this is the basic idea in Bayesianism. You know, Bayesian learning has been used for a lot of things, but probably one that you have encountered in, in your daily life is spam filters. Okay. 
I mean, these days there are spam filters based on a lot of different things, but the first ones, and still, you know, probably the prevailing approach is the Bayesian approach, uh, where you compute the probability that an email is spam, so that's your hypothesis, is this spam or is this not spam, and the evidence is, for example, the words in the, in the, in the email, right? If it contains the words Viagra and four exclamation marks and the word free in capitals, it probably is spam. Uh, on the other hand, if it says your mom, it probably is not spam. Okay. Or your boss, right? Finally, the analogizers. This is a less cohesive tribe than the others. It's more of a loose grouping of people who do different things, but it's all based on this idea of reasoning by analogy. Uh, you know, probably the most famous one of them, at least within machine learning, is, is, uh, is Vladimir Vapnik, who's the creator of, of support vector machines. Uh, Peter Hart, you know, was one of the early analogizers. He did some very important work in connection with the nearest neighbor algorithm, which is the simplest algorithm of this uh, uh, type and which we'll see shortly. Another famous analogizer is, is, is not a machine learning researcher, he's a cognitive scientist, uh, Douglas Hofstadter, who you may also know as, as the author of the book, Gödel Eschebach. And he actually argues, he has a whole you know, recent book, you know, 800 pages, arguing that everything about intelligence reduces to analogy, there is nothing else. Okay? He also coined the term analogizer. So what is the basic idea in, in, in analogical reasoning? Suppose that you, know, you have right now to diagnose a patient. Right? Somebody has a bunch of symptoms and you, know, you need to know what they suffer from. But you're not a doctor, you didn't go to med school. The only thing you have is a big file cabinet with previous patients, their symptoms, their test results, and, di and the diagnosis for them. What would you do? Well, a very simple solution is to just look for the patient in your files that has the most similar symptoms to the current one. And then whatever that one was diagnosed with, you know, you're going to diagnose this one as having the same thing. Right? This is a very simple idea, but it actually turns out to be quite powerful. Here's the graphical illustration of it. Suppose I give you a map of two countries, which I fancifully called Pakistan and Negaland. And I want you to figure out where the frontier between them is, but I'm not going to show it to you. I'm just going to tell you where the main cities are. So the pluses are the main cities in, in Pakistan, and the minuses are the main cities in, in Negaland. Okay? So how would you guess where the frontier is? Right? One natural you know, approach would be to say, well, a point on the map is in Pakistan if it's closer to a city in Pakistan than to any city in Negaland. Right? That, that's a reasonable heuristic. And that would give you this frontier right here. Which is probably not exactly the right frontier, but it's not a bad approximation either. Okay? And this is the nearest neighbor algorithm, one of the most you know, researched algorithms in, in all of machine learning. Now, there are a couple of shortcomings to this. One is that this frontier is very jaggedy, right? The real frontier is probably a lot smoother. The other one is that there's actually a lot of waste here because, for example, if you threw away this example and this example and this one and this one, the frontier wouldn't change, right? And here, maybe that's not such a big deal, but if you have a billion examples, that is a big deal. Okay? And support vector machines, what they basically do is they, they solve both of these problems. They throw away all the examples except that the ones that keep the frontier in place, called the support vectors, because they support the frontier and because examples are vectors. And the way they do that is by this notion of, of, of you know, maximizing the margin. Okay? What does that mean? Suppose that you wanted to walk along the frontier. Again, you don't know exactly where it is, but you want to keep the pluses on your left, right? The Pakistan cities on your left and the, and the Negaland cities on your right. And you want to stay as far away from each one of them as you can, okay? Your distance to the nearest, to, to each example is called your margin. And what support vector machines is do? They maximize the margin. They find the frontier that has the maximum margin and, you know, and keep only the vectors that are necessary to define it. And this, and this, you know, for many years was the leading machine learning algorithm until recently deep learning came along. And actually for many tasks it still is the best one or one of the few best ones, okay? All right, now let's, uh, let's, uh, oh sorry, one more thing. What is a, a classic application of, of you know, uh, analogy-based reasoning? It's recommender systems, okay? You know, every e-commerce site worth its salt has a recommender system that suggests products for you to buy. Again, you can apply lots of different learning techniques to it, but the classical one, and still one of the best ones, is, you know, this type of nearest neighbor uh, uh, reasoning. 
is to say, well, I want to predict whether you, you will like a movie. What I'm going to do is find people who are similar to you in that they have rated previous movies similarly. So, so like they gave five stars when you gave five stars and, and so forth. So they presumably have similar tastes. And now if they like the movie that you haven't seen, I'm going to predict that you like that movie as well. Right? So this is you know, a similarity-based reasoning in, 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 in its purest form. And it works exceedingly well. Amazon's, you know, uh, I've, I've heard, you know, from several sources that Amazon, a quarter of Amazon's business comes from its, sorry, a third of Amazon's business comes from its recommender system. And three quarters of Netflix's business comes from its recommender system. Okay. All right, so let's take stock. We've met the five tribes of machine learning, the symbolists, connectionists, evolutionaries, visions, and analogizers. Each one of them has a master algorithm, a general purpose learner that you can in principle use to learn any knowledge from data. And each of these master algorithms you know, is solving an important problem. For example, inverse deduction solves the problem of learning knowledge that is in the form of composable rules. Right? I can put them together like Lego blocks to do inferences that I have never done before. Connection is solve the problem of credit assignment. The problem of credit assignment is, well, I have this big complicated you know, learning system with lots of parameters, and I need to know where to assign credit and blame. Right? How much is this neuron here and this weight here responsible for the weight that's happening at the output? And backprop is a very clever solution to that problem. Evolutionaries solve the problem of discovering structure. Right? So in neural networks, the structure is predetermined. Where does that structure come from? Bayesians, as we saw, solve the problem of dealing with uncertainty. Any knowledge that we learn from data is necessary and certain. We're never sure that tomorrow we're not going to see an exception you know, to the hypothesis that we've seen. But patients have a consistent, well-founded calculus to take uncertainty into, into, into account. And finally, analogizers let you uh, um, generalize to very different situations from much fewer examples than the others do. In, an, in, you know, in this type of reason, you can do something that you can't really do with, an, with any of the others, which is you have only one example and from that one example, you can actually generalize usefully to another problem by establishing analogies between the two. Okay? However, the big problem is that in order to really have a general purpose learner, a true master algorithm, it's not enough to solve one of these five problems. We have to solve all five of them at the same time in one algorithm. And when we have that algorithm, that will be really powerful much more powerful than any, of the, than, than any of these five that we have right now. And that has been the focus of my research for the last decade and, and the focus of the research of, of a lot of other people. We're not there yet, uh, you know, but we're getting closer. So how might we put all these pieces together? Well, every learning algorithm is really composed of three parts. The first part is representation. It's the formal language, the programming language, if you will, in which you're going to you know, write, the, in which the learning algorithm is going to write the programs that it's learned. Okay? And the symbolists, their, their language is first-order logic, right? because it's first-order logic that logicians use to prove theorems and, and, and mathematicians and, and so forth, and that AI systems used to do you know, uh, you know, knowledge-based systems and, and reasoning and so on. So the, the symbolists use first-order logic. The, um, the Bayesians, right, they use things like Bayesian networks, Markov networks, generally known as graphical models. Those let you handle uncertainty. First order logic lets you handle, you know, complexity, objects, rules, things that you need to combine. So how do you put these two into one language? Well, the answer, you know, has to be some kind of, of, of uh, you know, probabilistic logic. And in particular, we've developed a language that is now widely used called Markov logic networks which is a combination of logic and Markov networks. And in essence, what it does is it attaches weights to the formulas. So I give a weight to a formula if I really believe it. It's a high weight. If I'm not sure, I give it a lower weight. And then a state of the world is very probable if a lot of high weight, high weight formulas are true in it. Okay? And so in this language, we, we can, this language is very cleanly a generalization of both first order logic. If the weights are all infinity, then, you know, then the world is deterministic, so you get first order logic. Uh, if the weights are finite, you know, then you get, and, and you're only talking about one object at a time, then you get standard graphical models. Okay, so this is a very powerful representation language, probably enough to do uh, you know, everything that we want to do. The next 
part of a learning algorithm is the evaluation function. Right? Again, the video that you just saw gave an example of an evaluation function, which is the sum of squared errors. The evaluation function tells you, if I give you a program in this language, how good is it? It's a numerical score, and usually it's higher if you know, your program fits the data better and if it has other desirable properties like being simple, you know, like being short, for example. Okay? And now, for, so what should we use for evaluation? Well, one thing that we can use is the Bayesian's posterior probability, right? That's a natural thing to use, which has you know, frequent statisticians' likelihood as a special case and, 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 and many other things. But in general, actually, the evaluation, should be def the evaluation function should be defined by you. The master algorithm actually should not have a particular choice of evaluation function. It should say, you, user, tell me what it is that you want to maximize. Is it the profits of your company? Is it your happiness? You know, just tell me what it is, and I will maximize that. Okay? Finally, there's optimization. Optimization is the process by which you find the program or the model that maximizes uh, your evaluation function. And here, there's a natural combination of the ideas from you know, the, the evolutionaries and the ideas from the connectionists. Right? When we learn a model, in particular, let's say we're going to learn a Markov logic network, right? we need to learn the formulas, and we need to learn the weights for the formulas. Okay? We're learning, you know, first our logic is a kind of programming language, so we can use genetic programming to discover them. Right? So we use genetic programming to discover the structure of, of our model. And then, to, and then to learn the parameters, right? Now I have my formulas. I just need to learn the weights. Well, for that, I can use backpropagation, uh, as we just saw. Okay? So in this way, we actually have an algorithm that combines the main features of, of the various uh, uh, you know, machine learning tribes. This is by no means the final answer, right? There's, there's still a lot of, uh, uh, you know, there's still, a, um, there's still a lot to do. And in fact, my suspicion is that as much as, you know, each of these tribes has worked on their idea for, for decades and made a lot of progress. My guess is that in addition to these five ideas, there are some key ideas that no one has discovered yet. And in some ways, it's harder for us who are researchers in the field and have been doing this for a long time to come up with those ideas than someone who comes to the field with, with a fresh mind. Okay? So we need your help. Right? Maybe you can have the idea that actually makes the master algorithm happen. And if you do, please tell me so I can publish it. <laughs> All right, what will be the benefits if we are able to discover this universal learner? There are a lot of important problems in the world that the current machine learning algorithms are not good enough to solve, but the master algorithm will be. Let me just give a few examples. One of them is home robots. We would all like to have a robot you know, to do our dishes and you know, make our bets for us and, and so on. But the problem is that if you look at what robots have to do, each one of those problems is there in a very clear way, right? each one of those five problems. So none of our current paradigms can solve it. People start from one and then try to hack the other things, but, but, they, you know, but they hit a wall of complexity. If we have a master algorithm that can solve all those problems, then we're much closer you know, to developing these robots. And, you know, an intelligent robot has to be based on machine learning, right? There's no way you can pro program a robot to, you know, to do everything it's going to have to do. Another one is, you know, um, you've probably, you know, seen or heard of Google's, you know, uh, uh, knowledge graph, right? And all, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, etc. they all have these projects where the goal is to turn the World Wide Web, instead of, you know, it being a bunch of text, which computers don't understand, turn it into a knowledge base. Right? Turn it into a bunch of formal knowledge in something like first-order logic, which you can then ask questions of. And then instead of the web just returning some web page, you know, instead of a, the search engine just returning some web pages to you, what actually does is it actually answers the question that you have. Well, again, you can't solve this without machine learning, and you can't solve this without combining you know, the, the, uh, you know, the solutions that all the five tribes have. So that's another one. Here's one that is perhaps the single most important one, and that's curing cancer. Cancer, why haven't we cured cancer yet? The problem with cancer is that cancer is not one disease. Cancer is many diseases. Every person's cancer is different, and the same tumor changes as it goes along. So there's no single drug that's going to kill all cancers. The cure for cancer is a machine learning program that says, okay, give me the, the genome of the cancer, give me the mutations, 
give me the genome of the patient, give me the medical history of the patient, and I will now predict what is the right drug for this patient, or combination of drugs, or sequence of drugs, or even a new drug that, 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 that needs to be synthesized. Okay? In a way, it's a bit like a recommender system, except that instead of recommending a movie or a book, it's recommending a drug to treat the cancer. Of course, the problem is vastly more complex, which is why existing methods can solve it, but, you know, but the master algorithm uh, will be able to solve it if you combine it with a lot of data from patients. That's the other thing that, that you have to have. And finally, apropos of recommender systems, the recommender systems that we have today, and you know, they do a lot of things for you, right? They don't, they, they don't just choose you know, uh, you know, um, books or movies, you know, like, it's like you know, Facebook is using machine, learner, machine learning to, to decide which updates to show you, right? Twitter to, to decide which tweets, Google to decide which search results, right? So like all of these different, you know, uh, companies and websites are using, you know, a little model that they have of you to predict what it is that you want. But what you would really like to have is not a model of you for one particular thing that's based on a very small amount of data that one company has. What, we, what would be really good is to have a complete model of you, a 360 degree view of you. That is learned from all the data that you generate in the limit from your stream of consciousness, right, from video and audio. And then that model knows you very, very well. It knows you as well as your best friend. And therefore, it can make recommendations and suggestions much better than anything else that came before. Okay? Now, you know, uh, all the major IT companies are in a race to produce this. The beginnings of this are already in your pocket, in your smartphone. Siri is trying to do that. Cortana is trying to do that. Google now is trying to do that. They want to learn a complete model of you. Of course, one of the things here is that you probably want that model to be under your control, not the control of Google necessarily, right? You know, Sergey Brin says that Google wants to be the third half of your brain, and this really is what they're shooting for. But, you know, the, t the first two halves of your brain are in your skull. You know, the third half is on a server farm in Oregon, right? Which is a little scary, right? You don't want the third half of your brain to have divided loyalties, right? So you'd like to be the owner of, of that data and that model, right? So that's one aspect. But the other aspect is that right now what they have is a big spaghetti, a big mishmash of a lot of algorithms trying to do this. And again, they're running into a lot of complexity. I don't think a 360 degree recommender like this will be possible until we have something like, you know, like the master algorithm. Once we do, however, I think it will be, you know, a huge improvement to our quality of life, right? It will help us to, you know, deal with information overload. It will help us to make all the choices that we need to make throughout our lives, like, you know, large and small ones, even finding a date, right? I found out recently that a third of all relationships that lead to marriage start on the Internet these days. And it's machine learning algorithms that are suggesting potential dates. So there are actually children alive today who would not have been born if not for machine learning, right? <laughs> so, you know, it would be good to have, you know, even better machine learning algorithms. So Anish Chopra, former CTO of the US, says that if we used a lot of technology resources, we could actually give people personalized recommendations for every step of your life. I predict that in the future, your model, the model of you, will be even more indispensable to you than your smartphone is. And the whole world economy will revolve around it. Every company, everybody will be doing things to target your model because it's your model that knows what you want, okay? All right, more about all of this in this book uh, uh, that, that I just wrote that Nick mentioned. It's called The Master Algorithm. It, it just came out. It's a popular science book on machine learning. The idea is to introduce the main ideas and implications of machine learning to a broad audience uh, without a lot of math, without a lot of pseudocode in a way that everybody can understand. Okay. So if you want to learn a machine, about machine learning, you know, going to one of those 600-page books you know, with 12,000 equations in it is a little daunting. Something like this might be uh, you know, a better place to start. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? What about what? Forgetting. Yeah, that's a good question. In fact, I would even say that forgetting is the better part of learning, right? If you can't forget, you can't learn, right? There's this famous story by, you know, by the, the Argentine writer, you know, uh, Borges, about this guy who had a perfect memory. And as a result, he was unable to function, right? He couldn't, you know, forget anything. 
And he couldn't distinguish, you know, he couldn't tell that a dog from the side was the same as a dog from the front. So forgetting is very important, or more precisely, in the case of machine learning algorithms, deciding which data you want to ignore, right, is very important. And we actually saw one example of that in backpropagation, right? Because it's error-driven learning, as long as only the things that you've predicted are happening, you don't have to remember anything. If you're just going through your routine, if the algorithm is just going through examples, and, you know, and it's seeing what it expected, nothing needs to be learned, it's when surprises happen, it's when you make errors that you need to learn something. Well, just I'm not sure exactly what you mean by regress to the mean, but in fact, the whole point of a learning algorithm, right, and the whole point of personalization is, is to actually to be make a, to, to make predictions for you that are based on on your data, right? So take recommender systems for example. You could just recommend the current you know top one box office hit. That's actually not a terribly bad prediction to make, right? Because it's popular, you probably like it as well. That's what you might call regression to the mean. A slightly better thing to do, but you know, but that won't get you, you know, but surely you can do better than that, right? Because people are different, right? You know, the top box office hit right now might be some stupid action movie that I'll hate, right? That, that could happen, right? So the next best thing, and what was traditionally done by marketers and so on, is to make predictions based on, you know, coarse demographic categories. Oh, you know, you are a, you know, middle-aged, you know, female, you know, suburban, blah, 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 right? That's better, but it's still very coarse. The whole beauty of machine learning is that it, 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 you know, given enough data, you know, it can make predictions for you that are based on you only. It's making a different prediction for everybody. For example, based on the things that you clicked on, on the previous movies that you've seen, on the products that you've bought, on whatever information is relevant. And so those predictions are potentially much, much better than the ones that you would make from the, from the weaker information. No, so exactly. So the master algorithm is a grand unified theory of machine learning. It's for machine learning what the you know what the standard model is for physics or the central dogma is for biology and so on, right? And I think we will get the same power out of it that we got out of those things, right? You could say, oh, you know, go back to Maxwell. Right? There's electricity, there's magnetism, but people didn't realize they had anything to do with each other and didn't realize that light was the same thing. So imagine where we would be if Maxwell hadn't come up with his theory of electromagnetism. That's where we write machine learning today. So, you know, we have to go beyond that. Well, that's actually one of the things that a smarter recommender system should know, right, is that you change over time. And in fact, some recommender systems, you know, are already starting to do that. It's to say, well, that's how you used to be back then, but that's how you are now. Or, you know, here are the tests you had when you were single, right, and then you were married and your life changed, but now you just got divorced, right? So let me go back and look at what are the things that you like to do when you were single. So stuff like that should happen. Yeah. Yeah, we're out of time, yeah. Yeah, I'll be around, yeah. Thank you.